Hi everybody, this is Jeff Kelly coming to you from Wikibon World Headquarters in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Uh, so of course it's no, uh, no secret to anyone that big data uh, is really uh, up, upending the world of the traditional world of data warehousing. Um, you know, there's new capabilities like Hadoop and other things that are really um, bringing new uh, processing, storage, and analytic capabilities to the enterprise. Uh, joining me today to talk about the kind of this evolving landscape, how big data is impacting uh, data warehousing is Frank Fillmore. He is the president and founder of the Fillmore Group, a consultancy uh, specializing in uh, IBM and information management. Uh, welcome to the Cube, Frank. Oh, um, thank you for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. So, so Frank, you've been around uh, for a while. You're founding the, the Fillmore Group back in 1987. So I'm curious, have you seen anything kind of as disruptive to the data warehousing market as uh, the current uh, interest in all things big data is? Well, I have to be honest, I mean, you know, I've been in this business almost 35 years, so I've seen a whole bunch of um, the, the, the next new, hot, cool, uh, disruptive technology. I mean, I go back to the days from when 4GLs, fourth generation languages, were going to take over the world. Um, but I really do think big data is going to have a lot of traction. Um, one of the different things that I see regarding big data that is, uh, is different is that the pervasiveness, it's not something that is starting in the IT community and spreading out, it's something that is really within the community at large in the business world and even in uh, the person-to-person the -person world and is, is growing from there. It's much more organic. That's an interesting point. So, so what are the implications for that? Is that? Does that mean that the kind of the, 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 your clients, the folks you work with, data warehouse administrators, DBAs and others, are they being, um, is it kind of coming to them, big data is coming to them, they're getting requests from uh, management from the business side to uh, start working with big data? Um, and if that's the case, how is that kind of different from some of the other trends you've seen where maybe it started in the IT world? Um, there's a, a lot of what we call uh, management by airline magazine. So somebody sits on a, a flight and reads the American airline magazine stuffed into the back, uh, back of the seat in front of him and sees something about big data and comes back and asks the IT department, the CIO or the CTO, and says, what are we doing about big data? And that, that becomes uh, the motivating force. But I, I think what's happening is that we, we have matured um, transaction processing. We know how to do that. We can do ATM transactions. We can sell stuff. We've done that in e-commerce now. We, we're, we're selling orders of magnitude goods uh, year over year increases um, in all, a variety of different ways from your phone, from your computer, and from your, um, your tablet. So what, what we're finding now is that companies are looking for um, new opportunities uh, away from the mature that is engaging customers at a level of intimacy that they had maybe had not before. So instead of waiting for a customer to come to you and say, I want to buy a book, will you sell it to me, which was the original a Amazon play, uh, it's much more about reaching out to people and saying, would you like to buy or have you considered? And that's where I think is, is, is a major change. Yeah, absolutely. That, that certainly resonates. So, so what, do you, what is the impact of trying to bring these kind of technologies that, that support that kind of, um, kind of uh, processes around reaching out to, to customers and the other things that big data uh, allows you to do? How is that um, impacting uh, the job of a data warehouse administrator who's you know, running kind of the existing data management infrastructure there? Um, you know, they're, they're, they've got to make sure the data warehouse is up all the time. It's mission critical. And now they're being asked to bring in new capabilities. How are they tackling that? What are some of the, I guess, what are some of the challenges and then maybe some of the ways they're uh, uh, adapting to these challenges? Good, good question. So first of all, I don't think that the traditional data warehouse is going to go away. Uh, again, drawn on, on my uh, uh, experience probably longer than I like to consider at this point is, uh, you know, I remember in, in the 1980s when uh, predictions were afoot as to when uh, the last mainframe was going to be unplugged, and I remember that the over-under was 1992 as predicted by Computer World, and as we all know, uh, there's still a lot of mainframe computers out there, a lot of big businesses are running and, and have been doing so very successfully for a while. So I don't think we're, um, I don't think we're in a situation where uh, the, the data warehouse is any more at risk than uh, the mainframe was. I, I think there's a place for data warehouses for uh, accumulating transactional data and uh, pr providing it in an easily digestible format on a regular scheduled basis. I think that's going to be the role of the data warehouse. So I want to know what our quarterly reports, our daily reports, our sales, our KPIs, those types of things are still going to happen. What's going to be different is that we have looked primarily within the enterprise to build the data warehouses. I, I say primarily. 
Um, but we have taken our transactional data and we have modeled that and massaged that and we have put it into a form which people can use to make business decisions. Um, and that whole process is what's being upended now with big data because we, we, we had a great deal of control over the metadata, the data about the data, the descriptors of the data. What we're doing now in big data is we are determining the metadata by the data content itself on the fly as the data is coming across a Twitter feed or Facebook pages or any of a number of variety of other streaming um, sets of data. We are, we are inferring what the data means uh, by its context. And that's, that's what's fundamentally different because before we would impose context on the data based on what we knew about where it came from or the system that it was a part of or something like that. So, right, so in the past where we would, you know, you would model a, a data warehouse, you would at, basically understand and know the questions you wanted to ask ahead of time. Um, now we're trying to take advantage of these new technologies, the, the, the scalability, the, the ability to store large volumes of data that's coming in in near real time and actually make, um, make decisions much faster. And again, that involves really, as you said, um, you know, not necessarily applying any kind of uh, schema to the data ahead of time, kind of schema on read, if you will. So what, again, what, what is the real impact, and, or I should say, what are the challenges of bringing that type of technology into the existing environment? You mentioned they're not going to replace existing data warehouses, and that, I think that's, that, that's accurate. Um, but, but there are, obviously, they, they play together. So in terms of integrating the two technologies or the different technologies that, that already exist in the enterprise, uh, what are some of the, again, what are some of the challenges and what are some of the um, techniques you're seeing your clients use to make that uh, a seamless process? Or well, as we, seamless as possible, I should say. Yeah, well, I understand, um, as, as easy as we can. Um, we've all heard about all the Vs, uh, velocity and veracity and volume of data that uh, comprise big data and, and differentiate it, set it apart, orders of magnitude differences in all of those things, how fast we get the data. Um, we work with customers whose data warehouses are refreshed once a day, and we're looking at uh, streaming feeds that need to be evaluated in the, you know, the thousandths of a, of a second in order to make uh, a business decision in terms of uh, stock purchase arbitrage and, and, and uh, those types of applications. Um, so that's one of the differentiators. So what we're seeing is that we need to use different models um, to manage the data, and that's one of the reasons that something like Hadoop and MapReduce are uh, so powerful or so attractive is, is that we're using commodity hardware, and instead of putting data into maybe a very expensive server, uh, what we're doing is we're unleashing a whole bunch of inexpensive servers simultaneously to, to try to arrest that, um, that, that volume and, and, and velocity problem. So, you know, you're out there in the trenches. Share with us, uh, you know, some success stories from your clients who are starting to really leverage this technology and, and actually delivering some business value with those initial big data uh, deployments. Well, the one story I like to tell back in the early days of data warehousing and data mining is the old um, um, uh, di diapers and beer story about the guy who went into the uh, convenience store after 6 p.m. to to buy diapers and. Uh, what was the what was the 70 percent correlation with a, a second product? What was the second product? And it was beer. Um, and this was uh, supposed to be one of the transformational stories in data warehousing that nobody ever thought to ask the question: What do you buy with disposable diapers uh, after 6 p.m.? Um, but those were the types of answers that you were getting from data mining. The, the questions that you didn't know enough to ask. So one of the uh, the stories that I use is was the recent resignation of Pope Benedict a business opportunity. And I'd say that it was, first of all, black swan. No one had resigned uh, the papacy in 600 years, so nobody could anticipate it was there. But if I were a travel agency and I was monitoring Twitter feeds and I was looking for certain hashtags, I could tell by sentiment analysis that people were interested in this event, and I would try to have, in, within 24 hours, a customized uh, travel itinerary in the inbox of the people who had been tweeting about the resignation of the Pope, sending them to Rome for the conclave and the, uh, the, the uh, installation of the new Pope. So those are the types of things that would never be uh, considered before because that by the time we gathered the data and scrubbed the data and put it into the data warehouse and was a were able to derive some actionable, um, some, some, some fruits from all that, a week would have passed passed and the opportunity would have been lost. Um, so 
So that's, one, again, one of the big differentiators in big data is we're going to be able to take uh, advantage of here and now opportunities that uh, the traditional data warehouse is just too slow and, and not agile enough to react to. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what is your take on the actual technology being provided by the vendor community right now? Um, obviously, you're, you're very familiar with IBM's uh, portfolio of data management products, I, you know, on the, both on the more traditional, I guess you would say, data management tools and, and databases, as well as, you know, they've got, uh, you know, they've been pushing very hard in the big data space with their big insights platform and uh, their pure data system uh, appliances. What is your, what is your take on the technology itself that's being offered to, uh, the, to, to the, offered by the vendor community? Is it um, up to, I guess, enterprise standards? Uh, is it easy enough or simple enough for, uh, traditional enterprises to, to adopt? What is your take, uh, both you know IBM specifically, but generally in the industry as well? Well, it's a good question, and uh, I had just attended some, some IBM announcements at the, the beginning of the month at Almond and Labs on April 3rd, and um, one of their IBM's new offerings is, is, is their pure data system for Hadoop, and it is an integrated platform with all of the um, uh, software uh, necessary to um, access or, or, or initiate um, a big data analysis, uh, IBM's big insight software, which is their Hadoop is distribution. And then all the piece parts around it, Hive and HBase and, and all of Jackal, all, all of JSON, all the different pieces that you need in order to develop MapReduce applications and make them successful. So one of the question, questions that I asked uh, one of the IBM executives was, okay, if the value prop is I can get a whole bunch of commodity hardware together and I can, uh, I can make this work very cheaply, you're going to send that, you're going to sell a, you know, an enterprise level um, IBM battle tested mission critical type uh, application server, the pure data system uh, for this purpose for, for Hadoop. Doesn't that subvert the whole value prop? And they said, uh, the answer I got was, and it was very insightful, we're there for, for phase two. Phase one is you know, the, the sandbox that you, you go out and you buy some, some old servers or you use, redeploy some old servers that are no longer being used, and you install all this software and you make it work and you get some answers that you, you hadn't anticipated before. You, you see an end-to-end -end proof of concept. But you have learned from this experience how difficult it is to get all this software to work together and to get all of it configured, and now you say, okay, we're ready to deploy to the enterprise, and we're going to start depending on this to make business decisions the same way that we depend on our data warehouse. It's got to be backed up. It's got to be available 24 by 7. We can't say it's going to be down for a week because one of our commodity servers took a hard drive hit and we didn't have a replacement laying around. So how do we do that? Well, we buy the appliance from IBM. We have all the software pre-installed. We have all the hardware integrated and we're ready to run. Yeah, there's very interesting comments. Um, you know, I, I particularly like the, the point you made about uh, you know, when they're doing these kind of experiments, uh, initial, early initial deployments for some of the early adopters, as you said, they're learning, well, this is a lot more difficult maybe than we thought. Um, you know, that you think of Hadoop and, uh, you know, inexpensive, uh, running on inexpensive commodity hardware, but that doesn't include the expense or the time it takes to uh, fashion that together and to actually make it work optimally. So, um, yeah, very interesting uh, take from IBM and uh, what they're doing in that space. So, last question, I wonder if you could give some advice to to CIOs out there who are maybe just starting with big data, they're just starting to even think about it, haven't even done those initial um, kind of experiments or initial uh, deployments yet. Um, if you can give one or two pieces of advice to those uh, CIOs out there thinking about this, whether it's from a technology point of view or a people and process point of view, what would it, what would it be? Good question. Um, and I would say that drawing on the experience from the data warehouse, um, back when data warehouses started to really um, take hold within the enterprise, uh, back in the, the mid-80s and, and then certainly er the early 90s, one of the biggest causes of failure that we saw was that people tried to boil the ocean. Um, I, I know of a number of different large institutional customers that I worked with who tried to do the comprehensive be-all and end-all data warehouse, and they were going to model every piece of data that they had in all their transactional systems and put it into the enterprise size uh, data warehouse. and then they were going to um, be able to, to get the answers that people needed in order to run the business. And that was the, the build it and they will come um, model. And, and a lot of those failed because people ran out of time and, punny, and, and money and patience. Um, if you have a development cycle that's going to last 18 months to two years and you're going to be sinking a lot of money into this effort uh, and you don't see any payback, uh, you may be an ex-CIO um, sooner than you'd like. So, so my, my advice to the folks that are 
uh, getting ready to embark on a big data journey is the same thing that um, we came to realize in the data warehousing world, which is start small, um, reduce the time to value to something that is manageable, um, you know, a business cycle, quarter. You should be able to have something up and running, uh, especially if you take advantage of some of the IBM offerings uh, that are prepackaged and, and have the time to value very quickly. Uh, and be able to get some return on your investment very quickly so you can demonstrate to senior management this does have value. Uh, these are the types of, of uh, in, this is the type of information, these are the data points that we can deliver to you that we were never able to do before. Do you want us to expand on this? And that's the way that I think you're going to get buy-in and support and ultimately success. Okay, great. Some great advice there. Uh, so Frank Fillmore from the Fillmore Group, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Some really uh, some great insights, and hopefully you can join us again, and uh, we can continue the conversation. I'd like to do that. This was uh, very enjoyable. You have a good afternoon. You too. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody.